Um, anyway, all right, so uh, DIY blue teaming. So like, I'm, I'm, like, I know this is a keynote. I'm sorry this isn't more like soft and leadershipy and all of that. I don't really know how to do that. I just know how to break things. So uh, I tried to, uh, this is my attempt at doing something that hopefully is breaking things from a more like leadership concept. Because frankly, like, I, I'm going to give you some tips and tricks. Like, okay, I'll just, like this is this is kind of the overview of what we're going to cover. It's it's like kind of some stuff that I've done at you know different organizations or like my, in my own like setups at home or stuff that I've seen or heard of or some of these things are ideas that I haven't like I've tried them but in very uh, lab like conditions. Uh, I just want to say that like I'm not a blue teamer. So there's tons and t there's so much more stuff for blue teamers uh, in terms of little scripts that do stuff for you or things that scale or like research, like the, the blue team is so much better at collaborating uh, uh, tr tricks and research than, than red team stuff for obvious reasons. So just, yeah, don't think that this is exhaustive by any means <laughs> at all. Um, all right, so the first thing we're gonna talk about is ways to make malware not work. Uh, why would you do that? Well, because usually, even if somebody's using Ode on you, the purpose of the Ode is to make malware run on your computer. And if malware doesn't work, A, like the attacker doesn't get in, or B, if they do get in because they get in, you, the, uh, the malware tends to, the malware not working can create errors. And errors are good because errors uh, mean that you can steal the thing they're using. <laughs> and you find them very fast and it kind of turns into a thing. Anyway, okay, so methods of making malware not work on Linux. Um, uh, anybody know what a syscall is? Yeah, so syscalls are like names, kind of like function calls that map to numbers, right? It's like, the, it's like the super secret API that sits inside of like every Linux kernel ever. So uh, a lot of programs expect those names and numbers to always map to the same numbers. Like the order is very predictable and people try to document this. But there's, there's no rule about that. And shellcode really expects stuff to be in the same place. So if you just change the numbers <laughs> and then reinstall a box, uh, shell code tends to not work. Uh, so that's the thing. Um, this, is, this, is like, this is kind of a visual example. So like, if you just take all those numbers on the left and change them all and then recompile your kernel, like, stuff will still work, but shell code won't. <laughs> uh, you can remove your shell. Uh, this is a trick I do sometimes uh, when hosting shady crap on uh, like EC2. Uh, you can just remove bash from the box entirely. So like nothing works. And then what you do is you modify SSH to be like, you know how you can change in your SSH config to like run a, a program other than a shell? So what you do is you, pro you tell it to run a program that goes and gets a shell. <laughs> so if somebody doesn't log in legit, somebody uses like shell code where there's no shell. <laughs> so it just dies and causes problems. Um, yeah, okay. Apparently I had slides for that, sorry. <laughs> uh, you can backdoor your own utilities. This is, I love doing this. Um, so, okay, say you have uh, a box that you want to be able to SSH into. Okay, so you change port 22 to go to a honeypot, so it doesn't actually go to SSH, right? And then you open up port 8443 and put, so this GitHub link down here is this super awesome uh, like multiplexer that this guy wrote. It's, it'll run SSH and SSL on the same port at the same time. And it's like a proxy, so you can attach a web server on one end and SSH on the other. So what you do is on your regular SSH port, you put a blanket honeypot, and then on the web side of the, of the proxy, you put some other BS-like web-based honeypot that looks like it's the same box as the SSH thing, and then your actual SSH is, well, if you SSH into that port, it just works. So if an attacker gets into your network, they're like, I don't understand why my SSH is going into BS land and why like web calls don't work. And you're like, ha ha, SSH into HTTP thing. Oh, it works. <laughs> um, I've, I've actually done that like, and caught people. It's, it's pretty funny. Um, so GCC should not be in prod anyway, right? Because you're all removing GCC from your prod boxes because prod boxes don't need compilers. Sure. Um, so the cool thing is that if you're doing that, you can replace GCC with something that's not GCC. <laughs> uh, like maybe it takes a copy of the source code and sends it somewhere to some logging box. So the whole time they're like, I don't understand. I keep compiling this exploit and it dies. Yeah, totally works. <laughs> um, uh, this, is, this is kind of like, I don't know, CCDC stuff applied to real world. 
Um, so it's super common in like competitions and CTFs and stuff that like people will give you totally unusable craptastic shells to use that have like ponies in them and bouncing ASCII art and LS remaps to Steam locomotive and ah! um, so you can totally do that and like build like a shell that's just garbage, <laughs> right? Um, and then you change your login to be like you know not a shell which is like a usable shell. <laughs> so anytime anybody that you don't expect logs in your box, they just get ridiculousness and produce a bunch of garbage errors. Um, similar is, uh, so like you can like take CP or MV or LN or like these basic Linux utilities and replace them um, in the unmoved shell with like take an evil thing and move it to my log thing that says that somebody that shouldn't be here is trying to use one of these utilities. Um, you can also backdoor them uh, sorry, I super got ahead of myself, but like when I wrote these slides, I had single ideas in my head, so I'm just figuring, I'll just talk, and if the slides don't make sense, we'll just get to the end, and you can ask questions. Um, uh, you can also make it so like, why would you ever need to copy at C Shadow? Right? So like maybe you modify CP to add a flag that says, no, I really mean to do this, so anytime any other user ever tries to copy at C Shadow, you can go, wait a minute. <laughs> uh, so that works. Um, this is a fun one. Uh, uname strings are arbitrary, so you can make them lie, right? Like, oh, I ran uname and it says arm. Attacker running arm exploit against x86 kernel. <laughs> um, this is a super fun one. Um, so, anybody ever hack? Any do any like hacking on like console games, like like Xboxes or Playstations or things like that? Okay, so like the reason those are hard to hack is not all the exploitation and the closed system and all that, it's because the processors themselves are encrypted, right? So what happens is you have these binaries at some level where the instructions go through an encryption process and the encrypted instruction gets read by the private key that's on the chip, right? So effectively, there is no such thing as decrypted in memory because the entire system runs on encrypted throughput. So it's, it's madness, right? Well. You can kind of do that <laughs> with uh, kernel modules if you have a modular kernel, right? So you take mod probe and you say, okay, like modify the source of mod probe and all this stuff's open source, right? This is why stuff's great on Linux. So you go take the source to mod probe and you say, you know, prepend all the loading logic with Zor against dead beef, right? So then you go through all your kernel modules and you Zor them all against dead beef. So anytime anybody tries to load a kernel module that isn't encrypted, Mod probe will screw it up <laughs> by zoring against dead beef, and then it just won't load. And you add a, you know, check that says anytime an error, won't, you know, anything, anytime a kernel module won't load, like send an error or send me the module, and you can find attackers loading rootkits. Um, is that a, I had slides for that and forgot? Yep, totally did. Uh, this is my slide where I was talking about breaking all the shells and totally got ahead of myself. See, I told you I'd do that. Um, uh, the, oh, the init ramfs check, this is fun. So um, you can, this is like all of that stuff like on crack uh, as one trick. So um, if you have a production server that only needs to one run one application, which is pretty typical, right? It's usually like a web server or like a database box, right? Um, uh, anybody know what a unikernel is? Well, other than Merlin. <laughs> okay, so unikernel is when like, you take a kernel and an application and merge them into one big blob of code, right? Or one big binary. And there's ways to do it. And it means that there's no definition between user space and kernel space. It's all just one runtime, right? Um, now, hypothetically, this could be really secure because it would let you build a very locked down environment. In, pre in, pre in reality, uh, all of the documented and preformed unikernels that exist are effing terrible, don't ever use them, they're horribly insecure because really all they do is just put everything in ring zero. Um, the init ram fs trick is that you can kind of get the same functionality without actually making the application and the kernel in the same thing. You just make a kernel that only runs run program, which it kind of already does because it just runs a shell, but instead of running a shell, you make it run like your database, right? So you don't need a computer for all other definitions of that word. You don't need all the other stuff. So what you can do is, uh, there's scripts to do, I actually should have linked it, God, that was dumb. I'll tweet something or, I don't know, I'll put it in the slide when I put this, when I make the slides public. All the slides will be public. Um, but there's like stupid scripts you can download where you give it a, you know, an app. You compile an app, you give it a binary, and you say, okay, I wanna compile this kernel, and then I compile this app against this kernel, and then I wanna build an init ramfs 
which is the file system that your kernel loads, that only has that program in it. Like, that's it. And there you go. Like, I mean, shell code doesn't work because there's no shell. Like, uh, like, libraries that aren't necessary to run, like, third-party applications don't exist. Like, there's just, just nothing there, right? It's like there's nothing, there's nothing to get. Um, that's cool. Okay, Windows methods. Uh, so this is a document that will tell you how to modify the registry uh, of a modern Windows box. I think it works up to like seven or something, and then they have, I don't know, Windows and stuff changes. Um, where anytime anything breaks, it will take a full dump of memory and put it in your crash dump and stick it somewhere, which should be like, it should be obvious why that's awesome, <laughs> right? Because, but <laughs> it writes to a file. Like, well, you don't have 32 gigs of hard drive space? Like, not that big a deal. Um, actually, I have a hard drive trick for logs at the end of this talk that, like, I'll, I'll cover. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, so that's, that's a thing. And people launch exploits. And when the exploits don't work, they produce bugs. And you can totally be like, oh, full crash done. Sorry, I'm going to speed up because I'm going to run out of time. Um, you can rename your PowerShell exe. It's kind of like the bash trick with the no shell thing, only like not. And so like only you know that you have to type like PowerShell or something or some random, yeah. Attacker runs PowerShell exe. It's totally backward. Does all kinds of horrible things. Um, this is a document from Microsoft on how to enable something called over the shoulder transcription. So this will basically log all the commands and any scripts that somebody runs in PowerShell. So like on boxes that aren't dev boxes, like people that don't need to be using PowerShell for admin purposes, like log everything they do, because why not? And then grep for badness. Um, yeah, that's, that's pretty much how you do it. You, you make an output directory, and you can make the output directory in SMB share, so that they're remote, and then you can mount the SMB share to stuff. It's kind of cool. Um, what is this? Oh, this is a, yeah, if you did that, this is a Linux snippet that will, on directory change, run a thing, so you can make a thing, vet the command, and you can spot, like, power exploit injections and stuff like that in real time. Um, this is cool. You can use open pro you can hook open process. Okay, I, I should have I should have well, okay. Hooking hooking Windows global functions is a documented thing if you're an admin. I should have gone into the details on how to do it. I don't know. Watch my last year's talk. I kind of explained hooking a little bit better. Um, but yeah, so if anybody opens like calc.exe or notepad or explorer, like those are pretty much the big three things that like like pen testers usually go after to hook because uh, they're well calc not anymore. Um, but Explorer definitely, it's the thing that the active user will always have write access permissions. Um, so that's what people use, so you can catch stuff doing that. Uh, you can backdoor a uh, registry editor, and anytime anybody calls regedit locally on the machine, be like, why are you doing that dump, dump string, like what? Um, this one, I don't have an active example yet because the code is still too buggy to be released and I might release it in, in detail at a different conference, but it's kind of cool. So uh, this woman is a genius Polish person who does not know that I exist. Um, and she wrote this really awesome uh, application called PSEV. What PSEV does is it scans the IAT inside a PE file, which is the thing that tells you where all the functions are uh, in memory and it looks for addresses that don't go to where they should be. This means it finds hooked functions and it finds hollow processes. Well, she recently changed this into being a DLL. So what I did is I wrote my own DLL around this and then wrote a simple little like four line GPO patch such that you can push a GPO to every system on your entire computer that will add my DLL, which has her DLL in it, into like system 32 and then change a registry key called app init DLL, which means anytime the kernel gets loaded in any process, it will also load this thing. And every five minutes, it will run scan on her thing. And if a result comes back, it will send it to you. So this means anytime any malware ever hooks anything on your entire environment, you will get an alert with a process dump of the entire malware in it. Right? Like, why buy carbon black? <laughs> uh, Apple methods. Um, yeah, put, put Samba system. like. Oh my God, like this works so good. Like I've totally caught, like, like I don't even do DFIR and I've totally done like pen tests where like, hey, let's, let's, like we think this might be pop. Let's put an SMP server on like a bunch of Macs and then see what connects to it. And a bunch of stuff connects to it. And you're like, well, that shouldn't be there. <laughs> um, yeah, you can write horrible scripts that do things a little snippets. I don't know, I'm gonna skip that because I'm totally out of time. Um, this is a, a resource for uh, hardening uh, OSX stuff, but there's a bunch of little like, hacky blue team tools in there if you read the whole thing. So like I just put the, you know, I'm not gonna take credit for somebody else's research, just read it. There's, there's, there's gems. Uh, miscellaneous methods. Um, 
Yeah, so like, it's really cool if you like, like if you, if you are running a web environment and you're worried about doing web app sec, um, put accounts that aren't real in your web app that nobody has a reason to access with really stupid passwords, like admin password. And then when someone goes to your web app and types admin password, that user only has mm, a Metasploit like Samba link there. So they just Metasploited themselves. <laughs> totally didn't break the law, they came to you. Uh, same thing, Canary users, uh, you can use Honey tokens to do the same thing. Oh, this is a fun one. Like, okay, so you, like, you, you put like fake AWS tokens like somewhere in your environment and then people log into a fake AWS environment and in the meantime you have like logging turned on, you can send screenshots to the cops, like it's funny. Um, security by obscurity, yeah, so, um, I've done this before too. So like you change your web app such that every time somebody reads your robots.txt it changes with different deny messages. <laughs> I'm like this totally works. <laughs> um, using TCP redirect in front of services you're actually running with a random delay, nine times out of 10 will make nmaps not work because people are spamming you looking for large stuff and if they have to wait an extra five seconds to find out that the port is open, they'll just close it. Um, this, is a little, this is a little bit of a story time so I'll try to move quick. Um, so, you used to be able to search for it by looking for malware blacklists, and now that has a very different term, so you won't find this. But there are sites on the internet where bad guys hang out where they list blacklists. And what these blacklists are is their IP addresses that if you are in the business of making and deploying malware, you should not talk to because they are owned by the FBI or the CIA or antivirus people running sandboxes, and those are the big ones, right? And they list who these things belong to so that you know who and why to avoid them. And they're, you know, they're on shady sites, but they're not typically hidden. So what you do is you go get one or a few, right? And then you write some software that takes a picture of a box, right? It gathers some information. No exploits, just gathers some information. And then you maybe log into one of these easily accessible honeypot things with your easily fingerprintable malware, because who cares? And you figure out what their honeypot looks like. Then you build that honeypot right, or a very reasonable facsimile and run it somewhere in your environment in a DMZ or do it five times or do it 20 times, which is even better, right, all of your IP space. And then you go to that form and say, hey, it turns out insert unspecified AV person here is also running honeypots in this organization. Don't attack them. <laughs> <laughs> and people will totally believe you and it works because they're paranoid. Um, very, very similar tactic. Uh, you can, five minutes, you can, uh, uh, register like FBI dot your org name here and then when somebody tries to log into it thinking it's lawful interception and it wasn't sweet you just broke the law like yeah it, that totally works um, warning doing that uh, I, I have done this on home IP space for domains that were projects I was working on that weren't technically companies and had people log in that were attackers but they had badges and they like didn't know I wasn't actually running lawful interception and they found out real quick and it got real awkward. So just, just saying, look, that's a, that, that's a thing. <laughs> um, this is the last section and I'm gonna burn through it because I'm super out of time. Um, so yeah, hackback tricks. So somewhere like in every one of your backups that you ever do, add like this, right? <laughs> oh, okay. I did not know that. So I, I can go a little bit slower or maybe we might, might actually have question time. Um, so yeah, this is a fun one like, I see honey tokens and canary tokens and all that stuff all the time. No, 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 screw that. Take like meterpreter plus plus, put that shit in like password backup auto exec dot thing, right? Wait for the wrong person to download it because no one should ever open that file, like ever, right? And if they do, you just have an instance sitting somewhere that says, mm, you're screwed. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I covered this earlier. See, getting ahead of myself, you know, beef hooks and honey attacks. Um, this is a fun one, uh, to solicit shells in your own notes. So you can go on like the bad sites where people like, there are, there are places where people are like bidding for shells that people have in other companies. So you can totally try to buy your own shells. <laughs> like, I've done that, they're usually not very expensive. They're like $100 a shell at the absolute most expensive. Um, you can distribute disinformation about yourself. Um, okay, so this is, this is the end chunk and probably the shadiest part of the talk. So uh, like, Originally when I wrote this talk, it was supposed to be less random hacky stuff and it was supposed to be more like, hey, there's a lot of security tools out there that cost a lot of money that don't need to cost a lot of money and also you can just steal their crap because they're badly made. Um, but I got yelled at by people who said I can't talk about 100% of that stuff. So you know, a little bit of this is I'm doing it anyway. I hope I don't get caught. Um, okay, so how to build your own FireEye, right? Well, okay, like all of FireEye actually is, is 
a, a, a relatively beefy computer with some VMs in it, right, that they claim are using machine learning and special sauce. Nah, it's garbage, right? <laughs> like, I mean, if it worked that well, like, APTs wouldn't happen, and they still do, so clearly that's crap, right? So I mean, if you really want all that, then I guess go buy a FireEye. But if you really just want, like, hey, man, I want to know that, like, anytime an EXE goes over my network, like, does a virus total hash exist for this thing? Yeah, that takes like an hour, right? <laughs> like, like that URL is a super, super, super easy Golang proxy library that like in 10 lines of code, you can send up any kind of HTTP or TCP proxy you want, any kind. So stick that at the end of your network, make it not do insecure skip verify so that it actually checks SSL, and then anytime, you know, have it, well, I'll, okay. So that's, this is literally, like, if you wanted to write, like, th this is code that will intercept anything to Reddit and replace the response with don't waste your time, right? So that's an example of using this library. All you have to do is modify that line of code to be, like, strings.search for exe, <laughs> right? And then download, you know, if exe download thing, run it in, you know, get hash, run it through virus total. If virus total returns bad, then alert. Like, there you go, you just created a fire. <laughs> um, this is a fun one. So I, I hear a lot of organizations be like, but how do I hold all these logs? And like data storage is a problem. And even if it's not a problem, it like exponentially grows and it's super expensive. Okay, so this is super shady, but did you know <laughs> that the free Dropbox account, <laughs> as long as you stay under the limit and you use a unique email address, is for 100 gigs and never expires. <laughs> <laughs> so there's this Linux utility called LVM that lets you take a bunch of drives and call them one drive. <laughs> so if you take an ELK stack and you mount it to an LVM image that's made of a thousand Dropbox accounts on a thousand different email accounts, voila, free storage. I've actually done this. It actually works. I've done it for like six months like to make sure that it totally works. <laughs> um, uh, Splunk is expensive. Uh, turns out Splunk has a dev license that gives you 10 gigs, and it's also free. They just don't tell people about it. <laughs> um, this is the shadiest thing in the talk, uh, and after this we'll have questions. So, how many of you have ever used AppScan? Okay, so AppScan, the, the, the web app scanner, sorry, not the, not the other thing that they make now, which is actually pretty cool. The web app scanner. The web app scanner is written in .NET. .NET is very easy to analyze, right? Uh, the, okay, so the way a web app scanner works, right, is it's basically a series of regexes for stuff. Like, yeah, we can talk about IL and abstraction and solving and straight solving. And it's freaking regex, right? It's looking for a pattern. It's possible that if one were to take the appscan.net file and look for static entities, one might find a SQLite database. In that SQLite database might be every regex AppScan uses. <laughs> also, there's a demo license that's free with the same database on the internet. <laughs> so yeah, draw your own conclusions. Um, uh, questions or random things thrown at my head because I was late or any, anything? But it's a comment. I statically link the kernel in a letter in the internet in a RAMFS, and it's really hard for people to break that. Yeah. Yeah, it turns out static. I mean, I'm, on my personal laptop, I just have a monolithic, like, no bootloader kernel. Like, just because it's Gen 2, so it's easier to keep a stable system that way, and, like, man, all kinds of stuff just doesn't work. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> don't run. Don't run. Yeah, yeah. I don't run a bootloader at all. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's nothing but waste for people to mess with you. <laughs> really, nothing? Oh, yes. These tricks, it's great, but at the same time, you can maintain them in the organization. Right, so how big is your organization? Right, so case in point. Like, if you have 2,000 boxes to maintain, yeah, okay, you probably have a budget to go buy at least one security tool. If you have 100 boxes to maintain, there's probably two admins in your whole company, and both of them will remember not to type shell code. <laughs> oh, yeah. 
totally can. I mean, like the PC one is like two lines to a GPO. You can do it using standard utility. The Linux stuff, like the mod probe thing, like all you need to do is, for, is go find the source for mod probe, which I probably should have linked. Um, you add like, it's 20 lines of C tops to do that Zor trick, right? And then that's a chef script. Like every time you build a box, add a line of your chef that says Zor string against binaries, right? Against like slash lib mod. Right? And then rsync up your, your mod pro binary. That's your modified source code. Like that's, that's maybe 30 lines of chef. Right? I mean, I guess, eh, I, guess I, I guess if I wanted to be practical and giving, I should have written that. But man, I'm, I'm busy, man. That's what to do. <laughs> <laughs> Hit me up online, buy me a beer. Maybe I'll do it. <laughs> Anything else? Really? Ha! Finished early. All right, sweet. <laughs> Uh, I mean, hmm? oh, more questions. So when you when you move when you move off change on the syscall around the setting, uh huh? You're a twisted son of a gun. So you can do that with Gen two, where you can then rebuild your compilers, your libraries, just according to the right. Most of the time, you don't have to. Most of the time, they use symbol linking. Can like, you the question? Uh, sorry, the question was uh, when you rename syscalls, like, you know, what about stuff that needs the syscalls? Um, most things that need the syscalls are built as part of your operating system against like the static maps. They're not built against the actual numbers. So if you change the numbers, then the only stuff that doesn't work is stuff that's making guesses about what thing, about where things are in your kernel, i.e. shellcode. Yeah. Am I done? No. What tips do you need to get you to see what you Oh, <laughs> nice. <laughs> um, no, that's, no. Uh, the question was what tricks used against me at CCDC are my banes of existence. I'm paraphrasing the question. Um, I had a team one year at Nationals who they didn't give them firewalls. Um, and so rather than come up with a host firewall, they took their Cisco phone and turned it into a firewall which was super effective because A, all of a sudden they had a firewall and it was natted and that was annoying, and B, because it's a phone. So it was like 10 base T. <laughs> so trying to do recon through 10 base T is annoying. <laughs> um, what else? Oh, I had a team one year modify their domain controller uh, such that every system on, logged on their domain had to have two factor auth if it was a remote login because they didn't have to remote login. So it was like, you know, I would sit there on remote RDP and try to log into something and it would be like, please enter your PC card. And, oh, damn it. <laughs> um, so that was annoying. Uh, probably, I, I, have, I have had, I have had teams do the shell, like that shell stuff, like I've had teams do that against me. I've had teams like remap LS to like LSS and have it do like, a snapshot of all the environment variables so they can totally tell like what web shell I'm coming into or what user I backdoored or things like that. Um, I've had teams like use my own PAM backdoors against me where they reverse just, where they run strings on it and they find a random path that makes no sense and all they do is change the path so that they get my passwords as I'm using them to log in rather than me getting their passwords. Like, <laughs> oh, man, it works. <laughs> it totally works. Because when you're trying to go fast, like you don't care, you're just like, no, why doesn't this work? And then like 20 minutes later, you're like, oh crap, I shouldn't have typed all that. <laughs> um, yeah, it's mostly just like teams that actually take the time to like reverse payloads and fingerprint them. Like that's, that's annoying because that's, I can't, I can't immediately work around that. Like if I have one or two payloads that I'm using to do a thing and as the game progresses, I'm, I'm relying on them for my access and then they actually reverse one of them long enough to change something that's like static, it's like, well, now I have to get back in and swap it out or recompile that implant because that's annoying. Yeah. yeah, that's the thing. Oh, I did have one team one year change their firewall rule to route everything to the cloud, which was annoying. We got around it because I just loaded a server in the cloud. But, you know, it, it took some time to figure out, like, why, like, nothing local was <laughs> open. Uh, anybody yeah. else? Yeah. Let me have that. Sweet, all right, done.